headquarters of the American. We're delighted to see everybody here. It's a great turnout for an evening where storms might blow in and out, depending on how things go. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me that we have such a great turnout, given the, uh, the topic for tonight. Um, one thing that I'd like to uh, think about is that uh, we're in a city here that focuses a lot on the Supreme Court, but most of the places you would go for an event of this kind is talking about issues other than international law or US foreign relations law. Uh, they're focused on important topics, but the space that they tend to occupy is not this particular space. And that's where I think the American society can play an incredibly important role in filling that space because there are indeed cases that bubble up uh, pretty much every year to the Supreme Court that are of great interest and uh, further cases that likely will bubble up in the not too distant future that are worth paying attention to as well. Um, before I turn this over to our moderators, I do want to note for this particular audience that the society does have a judicial advisory board chaired by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It meets every year in this very room for an entire day at which Justice Ginsburg chairs uh, a, a meeting where uh, representatives from each of the circuits, a judge from each of the circuits, reports on what's happening in their circuit. And they talk about family law cases, child abduction cases, hate convention related. They talk about immigration issues, torture convention, and so on, the Alien Tort Statute, Torture Victim Protection Act, and all that. But it's rather striking when you when you sit through a session like that, where pretty much every circuit is reporting on something happening in their uh, bailiwick that relates to international law. It really confirms that our field is not a field that's just operating out there above the national systems, but it's very much a part of this system and very much a part of the system of other uh, states as well. I'll also note that we are embarking on a program where we will be deploying panels to each of the circuit court conferences uh, on an annual basis. We're kind of ramping it up uh, at the, the present time, but the idea is to offer up a menu of five or six panels that uh, the circuit conferences might wish to have dealing with issues of U.S. foreign relations law or international law. It may be on topics that they're actively working on. It may be on broader topics where we're just hoping to educate the judges and their clerks a bit about the field of international law and its importance for the, uh, the society of lawyers, whether you're actively working on a case that relates to it or not. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to turn it over now to our dynamic uh, duo, Caroline and Jennifer, moderators of tonight's panel. Uh, please join me first, though, in welcoming all of them to tonight's event. Thank you very much, Professor Mur Murphy. Uh, my name is Jennifer Permsley. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of ACIL's Dispute Resolution Interest Group. Our mission, obviously, is to bring uh, programming and information on uh, matters of dispute resolution, uh, international law topics to the community. And uh, this is our second annual event focusing on uh, the Supreme Court's decisions from the prior term that relate to international law or international relations issues. Uh, we hope to make it an annual event. And uh, something we really strive for is to uh, form a panel each year that has uh, panelists that are not only experts in the subject matter, which these certainly are, but also, if we can, uh, persons who have actually participated in the cases that were decided by the term and by the court during that term. And I think we've done it again. We have a great panel. Uh, so let me start by just uh, introducing my co-moderator, Caroline Edsel Littleton. She is a lawyer at Jones Day in Washington, D.C., and she's a former Sup Supreme Court clerk for Justice Roberts and also clerked on the D.C. Circuit for Justice Kavanaugh when he was there. So she'll bring a lot of insight to our panel. Um, and then sitting to my left is uh, Lori Damroche, who's the Hamilton Fish Professor of International Law and Diplomacy at Columbia Law School and a former president of this society. Um, and uh, Professor Damroche served in the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor, including as a special assistant. Um, she currently remains a member of the Advisory Committee for the State Department on International Law. 
And uh, she uh, submitted an amicus brief in support of the petitioners in the JAM, the International Finance Corporation case, which is the first one we're going to uh, touch on today. Um, Matt McGill, uh, it, over at the other end of the panel, is a partner at Gibson Dunn in Washington, D.C. He has participated in 21 cases before the Supreme Court, and his win record is 16 of those 21, so not bad. Um, and uh, Matt also clerked for uh, Justice Roberts when he was on the D.C. Circuit. He currently represents um, the respondent in the Sedan v. Owens case uh, and uh, is a, a counsel also for some of the parties in uh, some cases pending for the Supreme Court's uh, upcoming term in the Bank Marcazi and Clearstream cases. Um, and so these are FSIA cases, which he's going to tell us a little bit about. Um, Professor Stewart of Georgetown Law School is in the middle. Uh, he uh, spent many years as an assistant legal advisor in the State Department remains a member of the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Private International Law. Professor Stewart uh, recently served as a reporter for the Restatement of Foreign International Relations Law of the United States and authored a guide for judges regarding FSIA issues. And he was an amicus in support of the respondent in the JAM v. International Finance Corporation case. So we're going to have some debate going on here on those on that matter. And uh, was amicus and counsel for amicus in the Sudan v. Harrison case, which is another uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act case that we can touch on a little bit today. Not one of our main cases, but uh, but an important one from this past term. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Damroche, who's going to give us a little bit of the background on JAM v. International Finance Corporation, and then we can discuss it. Thank you. Well, I want to live, uh, give a little bit of the background from a sort of personal point of view to explain how I came to be involved in this uh, amicus effort. And so I want to say it all started <laughs> a really long time ago because uh, we overlapped in the Office of the Legal Advisor of the U.S. Department of State. And David Stewart preceded me as special assistant to the legal advisor, a position that he held from roughly January 20th. 1977. No, no. Diane Wood preceded me. Yeah. Okay, Diane Wood was first. <coughs> she was in that uh, role for about six or nine months. Then uh, David was special assistant to Herb Hansel. And then when Herb moved on and Roberts B. Owen became the legal advisor, Dave moved out of the front office and I moved in and he showed me here's the smiling cabinet, here are all the immunities cases, and you, you know, the new special assistant, you'll be handling all this immunity stuff. So this sets the context for why when my former student from Columbia, Jennifer Sokoler, now at the O'Melveny and Myers firm, reached out to me in June of last year. She found me at my summer cottage in Maine and she said, cert was just granted in our case. Um, O'Melveny is going to be uh, arguing this for um, petitioner, and we are looking for any uh, law professors who might want to jump in on our side. And I said, "Gee, uh, what's it about? You know, send me, <laughs> send me the, the papers." Uh, basically, I said my summer is booked. I have no uh, uh, time or inclination to do this. But when it was drawn to my attention that a key um, um, part of the record was that it had been established. 1978 and then reaffirmed in 79 and 80 with a legal advisor letter uh, subscribed by Roberts B. Owen that dealt exactly with the issue in this case. So what was the issue? All right, so the issue involves the immunities of international organizations. By a 1945 statute, the International Organizations Immunities Act, Congress laid down that the immunities of international organizations so designated by um, the executive shall enjoy the same immunities, no, the same immunity, the same immunity as is enjoyed by foreign governments. So if you were just going to look at the plain meaning of words, the words to be interpreted are same and uh, as is enjoyed by foreign governments. And that was what Congress decided in 1945, when for the very first time, the United States in a big way was not only joining international organizations, but soon to be hosting them. And so we would be hosting in New York, the uh, United Nations, we would be hosting in uh, Washington DC, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and a whole constellation of other 
organizations that would be based here in the United States. And the United States had not been participating in any significant way in international organizations before that time, so had had no experience really with either the law of international immunities or what the responsibilities of the headquarters state would be. So um, Congress needing to act and to act quickly just said, well, we'll just borrow something. We'll borrow the law of foreign government immunity. And that was the statute, a very simple one. Now, um, in 1952, the executive branch rather drastically changed the policy of the United States with respect to foreign sovereign immunity by adopting a restrictive rather than absolute theory of immunity. And in 1976, Congress codified that restrictive theory in what we all know as the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976. And that act took effect in 1977, which was the year in which I joined the Office of the Legal Advisor. The FSIA as such does not say much about international organizations and doesn't resolve this question. So when the first cases started coming up after the entry into force of the FSIA, that touched on immunities of international organizations, the legal advisor's office had to formulate a position. And I understand that Mr. Stewart um, might have worked on some of those cases in, say, 1978 or 79. And I began working on them in 1979 and 1980. And the analysis of the legal advisor's office at the time was that the statutory criteria under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act became applicable mutatis mutandis because that would be the same immunity as um, foreign governments enjoy. So they were just you know, taken over, borrowed, became the reference point for the immunities of international organizations. And the legal advisor so informed other executive agencies, including the Department of Justice and the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, and um, the executive branch so informed the several courts that were considering these cases in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, and the executive so informed the Congress when um, treaties involving immunities were coming up for approval um, in that forum. So, so I said, gee, if this was right in uh, 1978 or 79 or 1980, or if I thought that it was right back then, then presumptively it's right. Now, I do have to admit that not everything that I argued as a lawyer in the Office of the Legal Advisor between 1977 and 1981 strikes me as right today. And that might be because of the change roles between being a staff attorney or a special assistant to the legal advisor and being a law professor with academic freedom, or it might be that the world has changed and we know more. It might be that international law has changed or the foreign relations law of the United States has properly changed. In any event, I said, well, at least I'm going to try to write this brief. I'll do an outline and I'll see if I can convince myself that what I thought was right 40 years ago is still right. So the first thing I did when I had an outline was I contacted this guy. <laughs> I, said, I said, I think this is what I learned from you a really long time ago. Um, if I draft a brief along these lines, would you be willing to join it? And he said, I'm sorry, but the other side has already signed me up. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, okay. All right. So I took other consultations and um, I, I did actually consult pretty um, I, I wouldn't say I consulted widely, but I consulted a very uh, learned group of professors and practitioners who really knew the law of international organizations and international organizations immunities much better than I knew the law. And some of them advised me that uh, this approach was right on target. And others of them said, you know, there's some soft spots in that argument or some weaknesses, or maybe I'm uh, hypothetical law professor might have come out on that side rather than this side. And I actually really struggled with it. And the part that I struggled the hardest with was that I needed to be absolutely rock solid in my conviction that the United States would be 100% compliant with its international legal obligations. In other words, that we'd be able to fulfill all of our obligations under our headquarters agreements with these institutions and under the charters of the institutions um, when we are a member of their constituted instrument, as well as under the customary international law, if there is any of international organizations' immunities. And only after I satisfied myself that adopting the FSIA as the reference standard, the default rule 
would allow us to fulfill all of our international obligations was I willing to write my own brief and subscribe to it. So I did that and it was a really interesting summer project. It was not what I had planned to do with the summer. Um, we benefited uh, from the support of the law firm of Jenner and Block. And if anybody is here from that firm, I wanna thank you in uh, person for what you helped us do remotely while I was drafting the brief over in Tokyo and sending them drafts. Um, and then I, then I had to shop this around to the um, members of the amicus group, some of whom I had sounded out and they'd said for some, some of whom might have been on my wish list, but they said either I don't have time to uh, acquaint myself with the issues or the particular role that I'm in right now uh, does not allow me to participate in amicus efforts or I have a client conflict or whatever. Uh, so I didn't get everyone that would have been on my ideal list. Um, but since David, the um, reporter for the immunities chapter of the restatement fourth of the uh, foreign relations law of the United States had already gone over to the dark side, it was <laughs> high on my wish list that his co-reporter for that chapter, Ingrid Wirth, would join my brief. So <laughs> I approached her. I didn't tell her that David was not going to be <laughs> on it. Uh, she looked at it and she made some really valuable comments. And so, I mean, I, can, I, I don't want to attribute particular uh, improvements to particular people, but her advice was very helpful. Um, we knew that the position of the executive branch over time, as far as we could trace it out, had been consistent, and I'm not aware actually of any deviation from it over multiple administrations and various legal advisors. The legal advisor under whom I served had died several years ago, um, but we, you know, we went around sounding out uh, legal advisors from um, both parties, and some of them had already agreed uh, for client reasons or otherwise to be on the brief that uh, would be in support of the respondent, but um, we signed up Harold Coe for our brief and a number of worthy professors of international law. You will find the list here. Oh, and then as far as other uh, reporters involved in the restatement of foreign relations law effort, um, Bill Dodge from the jurisdiction chapter, Sarah Cleveland as co-coordinating reporter for the entire exercise, and um, George Berman, not for the restatement on foreign relations law, but for the uh, restatement on arbitration. So uh, Jose Alvarez, um, top expert. Oh, I was going to get a whole lot of past presidents of the American Society of International Law. So Jose, <laughs> that category. Uh, Kristen Boone, who's an expert on international organizations. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've mentioned the ones who agreed to um, lend their names to this effort, everybody had improvements that they wanted to make. So the gist of the argument, and please tell me if I'm gonna exceed my time, I'll try to just wrap it up quickly. The gist of our argument, which overlapped with Tishner's argument, but ours was more directly international law centered. The petitioners themselves were heavy on domestic statutory interpretation and things like the reference canon from Sutherland's canons of statutory construction and things like that. And I just wanted to focus on really the international law side. And the points that I wanted to make were that in 1945, the United States had no experience in this area. Congress didn't need, Congress didn't know what to do, but it had to do something fast. It borrowed um, the readiest body of law, namely the then applicable law of foreign state immunity. I wanted to say that everyone knew in 1945 that the law of foreign state immunity was in flux. Uh, the executive was already looking at possible changes. So nobody expected that the law of foreign state immunity was going to stay stable as of 1945. The law of international organizations immunity was in a pretty embryonic stage and each of the newly created international organizations was coming up with its own approach. There are certain standard formulas. One formula was just that the organization shall enjoy such privileges and immunities in the territory of its members as are necessary for its functions. And so it seemed pretty clear from everything that I could determine in 1945 when uh, the UN Charter 
was drafted and uh, came into force all the way up to 1955 when the particular international organization involved in this case had its charter come into force. Um, all, all of these clauses took different forms. Uh, most of them focused on functional immunity. And nobody was saying that functional immunity meant absolute immunity. They were saying the immunity that's necessary for its functions, not greater than it requires for its functions. And for the category of international organizations that would or might be engaging in commercial activity, it was questionable or doubtful whether they should enjoy any immunity at all, except possibly for immunity from execution. So against that background, you had clauses being drafted, such as the clause that was drafted for the International Finance Corporation that says actions may be brought against the organization in any state in which it maintains an office. You know, that's not the kind of clause that you would find if the idea is to give it absolute immunity. Um, and so also you know, treaty waivers were being uh, pretty common in this era. So we compiled a treaty appendix that showed how, how diverse were these um, clauses. We looked at the materials that would have come to the attention of the Congress. We looked at statements made um, by key congressional figures to the effect that we're not giving all of these organizations absolute immunity. I, you know, Congress would have never gone for that. And so uh, all of those seem to me to be pretty strong points. So, uh, okay, I think that I can probably just um, leave everything uh, beyond this for the uh, discussion period. I would say that the, the Supreme Court embraced petitioner's position by seven to one with Justice Kavanaugh not participating. He'd been on the DC circuit below, so he um, didn't participate in this case. Justice Breyer dissented. And I was there for the oral argument and uh, Justice Breyer asked the toughest questions. And I knew that we were gonna have a hard time with him because he was saying things like, you know, we, the court, don't know anything about this. What if we get it wrong? Who can fix us if we pick the wrong rule? And that, you know, those sorts of things were troubling me because I was concerned that he was worried as I was to ensure that there would be absolute compliance with the international obligations of the United States. In the end, um, Justice, uh, excuse me, Chief Justice Roberts wrote for a seven justice majority and um, in essence, the reasoning is what I would characterize as the domestic law reasoning. It relies heavily on the reference canon. It refers to domestic cases, construing statutes that are largely domestic that point to some other body of law. And uh, under that uh, approach to domestic statutory interpretation, you update the first statute when the second one um, changes in a later time. There's not very much international law as such in the opinion, although there's a certain amount of foreign relations law in the sense that um, there's reference made to the deference that is usually owed to the executive branch in its construction of foreign relations statutes, and that the executive branch here had consistently said that international organizations do not get absolute immunity, but rather get um, functional immunity and get restrictive immunity in the uh, post Tate letter, post FSIA era. If there's um, one thing that is, uh, I think, intriguing to me, well, it's all intriguing, but there, there's one particular um, passage that I marked with a star, and that's where the Chief Justice says, uh, it's not so obvious that what international development banks do is commercial activity. So that's an intriguing thought because you might have thought that lending or borrowing um, is uh, almost presumptively, almost by definition, commercial, but apparently that issue will be open um, for consideration by the courts below. It's also very clear that the court um, insists that all the FSIA criteria would have to be met and that those include the nexus criteria. So the case um, at hand, JAM, versus International Finance Corporation does not clearly meet those criteria because the underlying complaint has to do with environmental damage in India. And um, that doesn't clearly qualify under the tort exception. And 
it might qualify under the commercial activity exception, but only if the commercial activity is being carried on in the United States or having the right kind of effects on the United States. And that's far from clear. So in our amicus brief and in all of my thinking about it, my stance was we take no position whatsoever on how the FSA criteria apply on the facts of this case. That could fall out either way. And then um, after it was all over, you know, got invited to a big celebration by all the environmentalists. And uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I share their objectives and their cause, but I don't necessarily predict or think necessarily that they should win um, on the claims in the case. Professor Demers, let me just ask one because I, we have a we're videoing, so we may have oh, a, okay. an international and wide <laughs> okay. audience, and I right. I want to make sure that the context of the case is understood. Okay. So, absolute immunity, you know, can't be sued. Immunity, as under the FSIA, means there's exceptions to that immunity, and the big one is if you're engaging in commercial activity in the United States, right? And so that's what was going on here. To what extent will this uh, will this sort of curtail or change the nature of the type of activity an international organization is willing to engage in? Sort of what's the real impact of this? And I guess in thinking about that, a precursor question would be, who is an international organization, you know, such that are we bringing, we're expanding to entities that we didn't really mean to curtail, right? Right. So, so, so this specific international organization is the International Finance Corporation, which is a member of the World Bank Group. Its mandate is... Um, funding of development projects in um, developing countries. The whole category of international organizations includes everything from the United Nations and its specialized agencies and regional organizations and uh, maybe even collective security organizations, everything. There's, there's the, the whole range of by now hundreds of international organizations. In terms of what the impact is, I'm sure we'll hear from my neighbor here on the perceived impact um, Professor Stewart and I will be on a panel together that he has set up for International Law Weekend in New York, and the original draft description for that panel says the Supreme Court has upended the law of sovereign immunity. You know, it's like they've, they've overthrown uh, what were the baseline understandings of the international organizations that agreed to locate their headquarters in the United States on certain assumptions. And I, yes, I know that we have... Uh, big uh, interests and big money involving international organizations in New York, Washington, and elsewhere around the United States. And um, I am sure that the legal offices in all of those organizations have written lengthy memos um, in the wake of JAM versus IFC on what those organizations are going to need to do to try to renegotiate um, their charters if their charters don't provide for absolute immunity. So the United Nations, I think it's pretty clear, has absolute immunity. And that uh, point will be made, I'm sure, at our panel in New York, we'll, where we'll have the Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs of the UN. But the UN's clause in the UN Charter and the General Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations is just very much broader than the clause for the International Finance Corporation that says actions may be brought against the bank in any place where it has an office. And that's just a very different kind of clause. Professor Stewart. I think, uh, were we not going to do Matt's presentation? I, I think, or you should talk first. Yeah, let's now. just, let's finish out this case and then, we'll, then we'll move over. Yeah. Okay. yeah, please. <laughs> let's um, not leave this time. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll be uh, uh, less eloquent, but maybe more direct. I don't agree. I don't disagree at all that the, the time for absolute immunity is gone for states and that international organizations really should not have absolute immunity, not in today's world. Um, very few of them, if any, actually assert absolute immunity. So that's not really the question. I think the question is, um, more nuanced than, than Laurie has put it. And I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, I, I, I got to say, I don't think this was a question that the court should have decided. It's one that should have been given to the legislature. Now, that's not a very satisfactory answer, even for me, because I doubt that uh, the legislature today would be able to come up with a very nuanced statute. So I, I realize there, <laughs> there are some limitations on that. But the simple fact is international organizations are not like states. They don't have the same kind of immunity, 
uh, and they need immunity for different reasons. So it's not a, it's a one equals one kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it's not something that ought to be decided case by case in the judicial system. What, what uh, I won't say what Lori has created, but what the Supreme Court has <laughs> created now is an uncertain, a, a degree of uncertainty in how this is going to play out uh, that will require, I think, years of litigation in very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, take this case uh, in, in particular. Um, the plaintiffs here have been harmed by what they say is a, is a, a mistake, a, a failure of policy, a failure of oversight that resulted in, among other things, environmental damage. Apparently they have real damages, I don't know. Uh, and they'd like to get recompense. They didn't sue in India where, where the damages took place. They came here to Washington because that's the headquarters of the international organizations. So on the, on the one hand, you say, well, it really has nothing to do with us. It, it, why should American courts apply American law uh, to something that happened uh, between an or international organization in India uh, just because the headquarters are here? The answer is, well, if it were a corporation and the decision were made at headquarters, you'd have a locus, et cetera. You'd say, well, that's a little bit different from international organizations. Um, frankly, the answer is international organizations ought to have internal uh, mechanisms for resolving this, not only for things like employment disputes, and, and uh, Laurie is quite right, they've long not had immunity from employment disputes, but is it really something that belongs in the EEOC applying U.S. law, how a, a, an international organization in, in Washington deals with its international um, uh, staff? That's something that ought to be resolved internally and something like the IFC ought to have an internal mechanism. If there's a bright side to this decision, it is that it puts pressure on international organizations to resolve their disputes with, with folks internally. I think it's highly regrettable, for example, that the UN has never uh, come to a resolution of the Haiti cholera situation, which for which I think they have to accept that responsibility. That suit also was brought in, New York, in, in the United States and was dismissed on the grounds of, of immunity I think rightly, uh, legally, and wrongly in the sense that the UN is not being held accountable and doesn't appear. So one good thing that will come out of this is that it puts pressure on the international organizations, if for no other reason out of fear of litigation in US courts, to do what they ought to do is have internal mechanisms to resolve this. Unfortunately, what I think is gonna happen is a massive amount of litigation in US courts on this kind of situation following uh, uh, Lori's thing, and, and we'll have U.S. judges who, who will see, what do you think, there's a problem, somebody's been harmed, this organization is standing back saying, I have immunity, I need to make a solution. And we all understand that courts like to do that. They don't like to say nothing can be done. But I don't think it's really appropriate for U.S. courts. Last point, and a very technical one, the real problem I have with your brief and your analysis is that you equate international, the International Organizations Immunities Act with the FSIA, and they're two very different statutes. Very simply, the IOIA, for historical reasons that Laurie has already mentioned, uh, puts the onus on the president. It says international organizations get the uh, immunity that the president says. It's in the executive branch. Now, as a practical matter, many of them get what is in their basic treaty or in their specialized treaty, but the default is it's an executive function. Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is exactly the opposite. It takes the immunity in, uh, decision away from the executive and puts it in the courts. So the two statutes don't fit together very well. International organizations aren't like states. They have different needs. Their immunity comes from a functional rather than a, a sovereignty-based uh, notion. Uh, the statutes don't work together. We're now faced with a situation where a court's got to say, well, the court has said international organization immunities means the same immunities as the FSIA. And so now we got to look, is there a commercial activities exception? Um, it's not at all clear to me that the IFC is going to get away with having a no commercial activity here. I think it looks like it is exactly what commercial banks do. That's why the IFC exists. It exists to make commercial loans, development loans, when the commercial entities don't do it. Uh, but they're going to have to struggle with this. Um, and and uh, we don't know whether, for example, the non-commercial tort exception applies. We don't know if the arbitration exception applies. We don't know if the terrorism exception applies. That is a horrific thought, actually. Well, I know she's got a lot of answers from this, but these are not clear from the opinion. So I think we're heading into uh, a difficult uh, series of, of lawsuits with conflicting answers, circuit splits, messy cases.
Um, in a better world, I would have rather had a, a provision put to uh, the legislature saying, here's how we're going to amend the statute. Let's fix this. So just to put a point on it, I don't disagree on the major point about absolute immunity versus uh, functional immunity, more limited immunity. That's, that's clear. That's, that's what we were thinking back then. I just don't think this was the right mechanism and it's going to end up causing problems. Thank you. So, so let's move on. We have a lot of a lot of cases to get through. Maybe we'll have some time to come back at questions in the end to this interesting matter. Um, so we're going to turn over to Matt now to tell us a little bit about uh, the Sudan cases. Yeah, and Matt's going to talk about a cluster of FSIA cases, Sudan v. Harrison, which was decided last term, Opati v. Sudan, which will be heard and decided this term, and then Bank Markazi v. Peterson. Um, there's a cert petition pending. The court called for the views of the Solicitor General the Solicitor General praised its outstanding and interesting <laughs> Especially by me. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, Sudan versus Harrison. Uh, this is a case that was argued last uh, last fall in November, decided in, in March of this year. Uh, this is a case about the nitty gritty of lawyering. It doesn't, re it's not really about high-minded principles of international law. This is about how to serve a defendant uh, when the defendant is a sovereign government. And the lesson of the case is that you had better do it right. Um, the FSIA provides for uh, very specific methods of service of process on a sovereign government. It provides for four methods, each of kind of a hierarchy of methods, each of which uh, must be attempted or be deemed inapplicable before you can move on to the next. The first method is if there's a special arrangement that exists between the, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant state. So take, uh, for example, in most uh, bond cases, uh, I litigated against Argentina over sovereign bonds for 10 years, and in virtually every sovereign bond, there will be a provision for service of process. So that's your uh, paradigmatic special arrangement. Second, uh, the second method is service pursuant to an international convention, basically the Hague Convention on service of process. Uh, there are 75 countries uh, that are signatories uh, to the Hague Convention. So that covers a good swath of the world. Um, it does not, however, cover Sudan. Um, so then you move on to the third method. The third method is that you serve uh, the, the foreign minister uh, at, by, a, by a mailing addressed and dispatched to the foreign minister. And that is the, the provision at issue here. And if you fail in that uh, method, then you can, the clerk of the court can uh, send a piece of mail to the State Department, and then the State Department can transmit it through diplomatic channels. And that way never fails. So we're told that is the final uh, stop in service of process. So um, this case is about the third of those methods, uh, what it means to serve the foreign minister. And the, the actual uh, the language that the statutory language that is relevant here is by any form of mail requiring a signed receipt to be addressed and dispatched to the head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Foreign State Concerned. This case arises from the bombing of the USS Cole in 2000. The plaintiffs are uh, victims and families of that act of terrorism. Uh, in 2010, they sued the government of Sudan for the material support it provided to Al-Qaeda in connection with that terrorist attack. Uh, they sued down in Virginia obtained uh, a default judgment against Sudan when after they served the complaint, Sudan didn't show up. Uh, and having that default judgment in hand, uh, the plaintiffs went and seized uh, or levied upon certain bank accounts in New York that were held in the name of instrumentalities of Sudan. And, that, uh, and it was at that point that Sudan came, showed up uh, showed up in court and raised a jurisdictional objection saying, you served the foreign minister at the embassy here in Washington, DC. You were required to serve him at the foreign ministry in Khartoum. And 
you know, the Second Circuit, uh, the district court rejected that argument, uh, ordered the turnover of the funds to these plaintiffs. Sudan appealed to the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit looked at that language. By any form of mail requiring a signed receipt to be addressed and dispatched to the head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs <laughs> of the foreign state concerned. Well, it doesn't say you have to send it to the foreign ministry at you know, and in the home country, um, it's addressed to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it was, you know, they don't claim they didn't get it. Uh, they, they, they did receive it. The foreign minister did, did in fact receive the service of process. Um, so the Second Circuit affirmed. Uh, Sudan files a petition for rehearing. And now out of the woodwork comes the United States led by the State Department and say, no, you have to serve at the foreign ministry. Uh, you can't serve simply at the embassy. We can't have, you know, it's important that this is the argument that the United States made. Uh, it's you know, important, obviously, that when you are serving a, you know, a complaint on a foreign state, that the appropriate official gets timely notice of that. And if you're dropping this off at the mailroom of the U.S. Embassy in uh, here, here in Washington, uh, you know, it could be several weeks could go by before it actually gets to the foreign minister in, in the home country. And, you know, by that time, uh, pretty soon they're staring at a default judgment. Uh, the U.S. also raised reciprocity concerns, the idea that, well, geez, if, if you know, other countries could allow for for the for the secretary of state to be served just about at any one of our 200 plus embassies or consulates around the world um and the second circuit denied rehearing so sudan uh sought review in the supreme court and uh i you know and and they called for the views of the solicitor general which i thought that was you know kind of a uh just a waste of time. We kind of knew what the United States government <laughs> thought. They told you what you, they thought in the, in the Second Circuit. But the Supreme Court does this in virtually every case uh, concerning the FSIA. They, they will call for the views of the SG, uh, even if the United States has appeared in the courts below and, and taken a position. They want to just make sure that that's still the position. Um, so the, uh, the SG, while the case was pending uh, before the Supreme Court, but before it granted, the Fourth Circuit uh, addressed the same issue involving uh, another set of plaintiffs also um, arising from the bombing of the USS Cole in a case called Kumar. And in, in the Kumar case, the Fourth Circuit conclude, adopted Sudan and the United States' argument that service had to be affected under this third option at the foreign ministry in the home country. So now you have a, uh, a direct circuit split, uh, both involving, uh, both cases involving different sets of plaintiffs arising from the same act of terrorism. It, you know, this was a case the Supreme Court had to review. And it, by a seven to one, mar uh, eight to one margin, uh, the Supreme Court concluded that the service uh, in this case was ineffective because it was served at the embassy and not at the foreign ministry in Khartoum. Um, the analysis is, uh, you know, pretty typical for Supreme Court decisions these days. It's rigorously textual. It doesn't uh, really come to any. Uh, it doesn't even refer to uh, principles of international law until the tail end of the opinion when uh, Justice Alito for the majority said that another reason to adopt this construction uh, is that it, quote, avoids concerns uh, that might arise under the uh, Vienna Convention uh, relating to diplomatic immunity. And uh, that was a carefully chosen language because as Justice Thomas pointed out in his dissent, the FSIA was enacted some 20 years after this Vienna Convention thing. So if there's any conflict between the FSIA and the Vienna Convention, the FSIA uh, prevails. So 
the, the Supreme Court did not suggest that there was a conflict between the two, but rather only that there were some concerns uh, of a potential conflict <clears throat> if, uh, if you adopted the other side, if you adopted Harrison's uh, position here. Um, yeah, I think for uh, Justice Alito, the, the textual analysis is, is a little bit strained. Um, he he can derives from the uh, from the text from the words addressed and dispatched uh, the conclusion that it that could only mean uh, delivered to the foreign ministry and could not mean delivered to the embassy. Um, you know, that's it's not a, like a you know obvious you know inference from those words. Um, I do think the, the the majority of the court here was very much um, influenced by what I would describe as the practical uh, realities of the rule that uh, the plaintiffs were urging. Um, one analogy that the court uh, you know, brought out in its opinion was that, well, imagine a world in which the U.S. attorney could be served, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the attorney general could be served in any uh, office of the U.S. Attorney anywhere in the anywhere in the country. There's 200 some offices, uh, U.S. Attorney's offices around the country. If you include different offices for divisions of each of the 94 judicial districts, um, geez, I mean, you you could serve, you, you could drop off the letter at any one of those places. Uh, address it to it, the attorney general, and that would count as good service of, against the attorney general rather than delivering it to 950 Pennsylvania. I didn't find that like, super persuasive because I think, you know, the Justice Department employees know if you get something to address to the attorney general, you know where to send it. <laughs> um, and the, the respondents here had, uh, you know, the, pretty much the same argument. Like, you know, if you're an embassy employee, and you get legal documents addressed to the foreign minister. You know what to do with it. It's it goes it goes back to the home to the home base, um, and that's exactly what had happened here. There was actually no dispute about that. Um, but this is you know a, an example of a case where I think the you, the views of the United States were quite influential, and uh, and did in fact uh, you know influence the court into holding seven to one that. Uh, eight to one, I keep saying seven, eight to one, that the service here had to be made at the foreign ministry. You know, so what are the effects of this decision? Like, I don't think it's like, you know, this is not earth shattering in any sense. As I mentioned at the, uh, at the top, you have to, you know, anybody, any country that's a hate convention signatory, you know, you, you don't get to eight three. So this uh, and if there's in any bond case or any essentially any contract case it is is not going to you know use this but it's not it's also not like you know totally insignificant uh, uh involved in a case right now involving enforcement of an exit award against a country that is you know uh where maybe they they have refused service under the Hague Convention, so then you got to go to A3, and now um, now you've got this uh, situation where the Supreme Court has told us very clearly what to do, and there's value in having a clear rule that everyone can follow. You know that you have to send it to the foreign ministry. Uh, in the home country. Um, so that's Harrison. I don't, should we just pause there for a moment and yeah, see? Can I jump in with a question and sure. maybe David can speak to a few points because David submitted an amicus brief in this case um, and your position prevailed. Um, and one question I had in reading this opinion was, Laurie spoke to how the Supreme Court's jam opinion was very domestic in nature, it was textually focused. I think the same can be said about this case. They really hone in on the text David, in your amicus brief, uh, you highlighted the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and also some customary international law concepts right. as well, which the Vienna Convention made its way into the opinion, the customary international law not no. so much. No. No. And I think the court in um, Sudan v. Harrison even admitted that traditional principles of statutory interpretation were somewhat unsatisfying with respect to these provisions because of this not ideal draftsmanship. 
So I suppose the question is, what do you think would be the ideal methodological approach for interpreting the SSIA, and how can the court be convinced to implement that approach, which presumably would incorporate a little bit more international legal analysis? That, that's a profound question. <laughs> First of all, let me say I agree. I agree with Matt's analysis, and I, and I also think the court got it right here. That this is a straightforward question, and, and there is value in clarifying for the the, uh, the lower courts. I mean, I, I think what was going on. Part of what was going on here is the Second Circuit was was going off on the side road, hey, saying, well, we can we can uh, let this statute be interpreted and applied flexibly. And I think the court is saying, no, this is what Congress has said, uh, and it's clear enough, and so stick to the statute. Behind that, I think this responds to your question, is this pervasive sense that um, didn't really show up in the jam case, but does pretty clearly appear behind the curtains here, is we're dealing in the foreign affairs area. And some deference is due, and we hear this from the court all the time, one way or another, some deference is due here to the, to the views of the executive branch, given the executive branch's role in foreign affairs. These things aren't just legal cases, they are highly political. And also, I think it was also uh, the reciprocity notion that we get sued around the world. I mean, don't belittle the fact, yes, the United States gets sued a lot every day around the world, and the Justice Department has a pretty good interest in knowing that they get told. So. There isn't a clear, one very clear rule on service of process for the simple reason that most countries in the world don't have the same system of service. The UN Convention on, on Jurisdictional Immunities in 2004 does have a provision on it. Unfortunately, it says you get 30 days notice. We wanted 60, which is normally what we asked for. But there is the reciprocity thing, and then there's the, the, the foreign affairs, sort of the hint of the foreign affairs dimension here, um, which for some reason didn't show up in Laurie's brief, um, but and, and that may be one reason. I don't know if that's convincing to you or not. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think the, the court here, I mean, at the end of the opinion, they, they say, well, the, the plaintiffs here, the, the, who are the respondents in this case, had, had made a pitch to say, this is a really, really tough pill you're asking us to swallow. I mean, we you're telling us because we we sent this packet of mail to the embassy rather than the foreign ministry where everyone admits that they got it and they you know that they had all the notice that they that they were supposed to get um that because of that our judgments which are now nine years old go away and we have to start over completely like never mind the fact that we lose the 40 million dollars that we laid our hands on for people who were killed or injured 19 years ago in an act of terrorism, and you're telling us that we have to start over today for this kind of a technicality, and the you know Justice Alito's answer to that is is that in cases involving these sensitive you know diplomatic areas, we have to have uh, clear rules, and that kind of overrides the. Uh, the equitable concerns, which might point in the other direction. So at least to the extent that the court is is urging, you know, is saying, yeah, in, in these cases, we have to have clear rules. I think if you look across a broad, broader swath of, of cases, I, I'm not sure you see a, a pattern of deference to the, to the United States' views. Um, I think the United States is, you know, losing at least as many of these cases as it's winning. Um, in terms of the cases, you know, of what side it chooses. Um, the, what, what you do see, I think, it, it, at least in the last 10 years, is a clear uh, string of cases in which the Supreme Court says, in, that, in the FSIA, we start, the, the analysis really does start and end with the text. Mm -hmm. And you, you, so if the, there is no, if the text does not provide the immunity that the sovereign is, is asserting, there, that immunity doesn't exist. Um, and so you see that most clearly in the 2013 case, uh, NML versus Argentina, that, mm -hmm. or Argentina versus NML, it's a case I was involved in way back when, where the sovereign there was asserting an immunity from discovery. Uh, post-judgment discovery, and they lost that case um, very bad. 
Um, so now we have worldwide post-judgment discovery. And you know the, the United States doesn't think that's a, a great outcome for, uh, for sovereigns, but that was the, uh, that was what the stat, there was no such immunity provided for in the statute and the Supreme Court, you know, seven to two yeah. seemed to think that that was just fine. So I, I want to come back to that notion of you know the court doing what the what the SG says it should do as you as you touch on the other matters that are uh, yeah pending in this area. So well, let's should move we to the next one? So you want to move on to Opati? Okay. So um, the, this is like the Sudan era at the Supreme Court. Um, Sudan is now, if you haven't figured it out, they're very well represented uh, by by White and Case uh, and uh, has launched, uh, you know, are, are litigating their appeals uh, well and are getting, um, uh, making, you know, noticeable progress uh, in, in various areas. Opati. So Opati is a case that arises from the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in uh, Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Um, this is a case that, uh, as it, it started before uh, Judge Bates here in DDC. The, the first case there uh, was uh, called Owens and uh, Owens versus uh, Sudan and Iran. And that, case, and that case was filed in 2001. Um, the various groups of plaintiffs uh, intervened or, or, or filed related actions that all were ended up before Judge Bates. And um, there, at this point now, you, you would uh, let's just say three groups of plaintiffs, uh, three big groups of plaintiffs. Um, and Judge Bates ends up entering uh, in 20, starting in 2011 and concluding in 2014, judgments against Sudan totaling roughly $6 billion in compensatory damages and $4 billion in punitive damages. Um, I represent, uh, represented before the D.C. Circuit and continue to represent um, these victims of the U.S. Embassy bombings. Uh, so, um, but the people that I represent had only compensatory damage awards. But I argued for everyone in front of the D.C. Circuit against Sudan's various challenges to both liability and damages. Um, Sudan had a... Uh, uh, many uh, arguments uh, before the DC circuit, uh, something like nine issues presented. Um, one, of, one of them was uh, whether the 2008 uh, amendments to the FSIA and the 2008 amendments to the, the terrorism exception of the FSIA um, provided for punitive damages in uh, to apply retroactively to past acts of terrorism. So uh, there is no, there was no dispute that these 2008 amendments provided a punitive damages remedy. Sudan's assertion was though, that that could only be forward looking for future acts of terrorism or post 2008 acts and could not uh, be applied to uh, acts of terrorism that had occurred uh, prior to uh, the enactment of the statute. Um, that was the one issue in the case that I lost. Um, so we, the, the DC circuit affirmed uh, the findings of liability, affirmed all of the compensatory damage awards. Uh, it, it, it certified to the DC Court of Appeals a question of DC law, which I could talk about, but it's beyond the scope of this. Um, but we won that piece too. <laughs> and, but the one piece that we lost was whether punitive damages uh, could apply in these cases. Um, so after the DC Circuit rehearing petition is denied, um, Sudan files a cert petition. Um, raising several questions. Um, and then 
the group of plaintiffs that had punitive damages filed their own cert petition saying that the DC Circuit got it wrong when it threw out our punitive damage awards. Um, the Supreme Court called for the views of the Solicitor General. Um, the Solicitor General took a long time. Um, and But finally, uh, towards the uh, end of the spring, filed briefs uh, that recommended that all of the questions, which total seven at this point in time, raised by Sudan, be denied, but that the question about punitive damages be granted. And I will confess, I was surprised. Um, it was uh, the, you know, the State Department, generally speaking, takes a very dim view of the notion of punitive damages being applied to a foreign government. Um, but here, uh, the, the United States filed a brief very forcefully uh, for saying that the, that the DC circuit had, had erred uh, on the issue of statutory interpretation and that the Supreme Court uh, should take the case. And um, in cases where the court calls for the views of the Solicitor General, if the SG says take the case, the Supreme Court takes it like, virtually 100% of the time. I mean, so over 95% of the time. Um, the Supreme, if the court says deny, I'm, I'm sorry, if the, if the SG says deny, usually they, the court denies. Maybe only like 20% of the time will they grant a case if the SG says deny. Um, so here, what happened is Opati was granted and is set for argument, uh, I believe, in December. Um, and the remaining case, the remaining parts of the case, the Owens cases, are being held um, pending uh, disposition of the um, of the punitive damages question. Now. Um, you might fairly ask, well, is it possible that, you know, the resolution of the punitive damages case could somehow affect the compensatory damage awards? It's hard to see how. I mean, you know, don't want to say never, but it's hard to see how. Um, this is really just something that the court does when, you ha when it has multiple cases or petitions arising from a single judgment of the Court of Appeals. Uh, the court will if it's granting only one petition, it just tends to hold all of the remaining uh, judgments, uh, remaining petitions arising from the same judgment uh, until that's uh, disposed of. And uh, so it seems like that's what it's gonna do here. It shapes up, of course, quite poorly if, for Sudan, right? Sudan has raised a bunch of challenges to liability uh, and Instead, what it's got is instead of getting to challenge liability, now it's just trying to argue, don't increase our damages liability from six billion to ten billion. It's not not a great, you know, not a great setup for Sudan. Um, so, you know, having said all uh, that, I have uh, you know where I come from on this, and I argued it in the court below. So, uh, I won't pretend to be impartial, but I, I think the uh, petitioners in Opati have the much, much better of the argument. And, you know, it, it's, there's just a, a common sense uh, position here, which is it, it, if, you, if you understand what Congress was doing when it enacted the 2008 um, amendments to the FSIA, um, it was trying to create a, uh, a remedy for these, uh, for these people, specifically these people. Like the 1998 embassy bombing cases were among the, the, the cases that had been somewhat stymied by a 2004 DC Circuit decision called Sisipio Puleo. Um, and this, the two, Congress was acting in 2008 to fix that problem and to allow 
these cases to move forward and to move forward to judgment and to get punitive damages. Like there's just no question that Congress was had all of these past cases in mind. And the, the plain reading of the relevant text of the statute makes clear that it applies to any claim now pending. Um, the DC circuit uh, said that, you know, under a, a Supreme Court decision from far outside the FSIA case uh, context called Landgraf, um, that if you have a statute that applies retroactively, you have to have a clear statement uh, that it intends to apply retroactively. Um, the petitioners in Opati will argue um, that that doesn't apply in the FSIA. There's a decision in Alt called Altman that says the Landgraf principle doesn't apply in the FSIA context. And then two, even if it did apply, it's just abundantly clear here that the punitive damages remedy should be available. So uh, I tend to think, and now the United States is weighing in, you know, with both barrels saying the punitive damage remedy applies um, to these past acts of terrorism. So things are looking good for the petitioners in Opati, uh, not so great for Sudan. Um, you know, this case, Opati has much more significance than, uh, than Harrison um, because there are loads of judgments out there, especially against Iran, that are punitive damage awards that would be uh, vitiated um, by if Opati comes out the other way. So it's it's much more consequential uh, than I think than than Harrison that just involved a, a couple of unfortunate people who served at the embassy instead of the foreign ministry. So that's what I got to say about Opati. Do you uh, want to comment on Opati specifically? Do you, do you no, uh, I, I, I think he, I, I agree with you, Matt. I'm, I'm on your side there. Um, I, can I add, if we have two minutes, can I just yes. add one thing? Uh, just my professorial thing to put some of this into a larger perspective. I think it's useful. And here I'm, I'm borrowing shamelessly from Justice Breyer's book a few years ago on the court in the world. We're talking about international law and U.S. courts, Supreme Court decisions. Actually, what we've been talking about so far are the court, are cases in asking the court to interpret U.S. statutes that somehow relate to or reflect international law. So they're not directly about international law. They're about U.S. statutory interpretation, about the land graph, or about uh, uh, the, uh, the principle that, um, uh, that Laurie mentioned about the relation between two states and, and, and two statutes and so on. Um, I think most of the cases are, in fact, in that category. Uh, they, they implicate international law, but they're not directly about international law. Those are the most common um, uh, cases, and, and they're going to be more. The next group of cases, um, I don't know exactly when, but we'll, we'll deal with the, uh, the expropriation uh, exception and how that's defined. Um, you know that in the D.C. Circuit, we've got a case that says it, it's not just expropriation, but it's also the taking of property in the context of the Holocaust, a, a massive human rights, rights violation, which will pose the statutory interpretation question, what's meant by expropriation? Is the D.C. Circuit right to take an expansive view or not? If Matt's right and the court's going to go the textualist route, I think they'll tell the D.C. Circuit you're wrong. Um, you want to make that change? go see the folks down in the Hall of Legislative Wisdom, which is where I think you should have taken your <laughs> The second category of cases that often comes up uh, with some frequency now are treaty interpretation questions. And those are more international. And the one that you might want to watch uh, is the Manaski versus Taglieri case, it was granted in June. This is the fourth um, Hague abduction uh, convention cases. Drives some federal judges crazy. They say we're not, we're not family court judges, but they're international family court judges. <laughs> and here the question is, what is the meaning of habitually resident if you have a very young child? That's a treaty interpretation question. And what's really interesting about it and separates it from the first category is that that treaty and the US statute implementing that treaty require the courts, our courts, to take into account how other courts in other countries have interpreted the same provision. Uh, in order to apply, uh, achieve a uniform international interpretation. 
So that puts the, the case in a different posture. It makes it harder for the, the uh, court, any court in the United States, to say we're only going to look at the U.S. law. Uh, they have to look at the international thing. And that's, that's uh, I, I think that's a good thing. It's uh, uncomfortable because folks are going to have to brief what did the courts in Portugal say, what did the courts in Buenos Aires say, and so on. Um, but it's, um, it's from an international law point of view and, and a harmonious um, interpretation application of, of a treaty. Uh, I think that's a very good thing. So you can, you can watch that, that, that space. There, there are other similar questions coming up under the New York Convention that we can talk about if you're interested. The third category, and where the, the, the Supreme Court's been very reluctant lately, is when you're really talking straight up about customary international law. You asked about this before. And, and for the most part, these are alien tort statute cases, which asks the court to do something it really doesn't want to do, and that's what's customary international law. So you all know the, 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 the problems of, of um, holding corporations liable under customary international law, and the court doesn't want to deal with that. It's basically saying, as I read it, um, of course, they read my brief, <laughs> go down the street and talk to the guys in the hall of legislative wisdom. They got to solve this one. I, I think that's probably right. Um, and yes, I don't think the, the folks that in the Congress are going to be very active about that. They've, they've been asked to look at the alien tort statute over the decades, and they haven't done it. But there aren't any ATS cases pending that I know of. What there are are foreign official immunities cases, which is another area where, pursuant to precedent, customary international law comes right in. And the one to watch here is the Lewis versus Mouton case out of the D.C. Circuit petition now pending, not granted, having to do with the scope of something that's called foreign official immunity. It's not dealt with by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. It's not dealt with by the convention that covers diplomats. It's not covered by international organizations. It's just pure, straight up customary international law. The Supreme Court has said, um, as in, incorporated into common law, that's the rule. And the courts are fragmented on this. I think there'll be another, another case. So that's really three different kinds of approaches. And I think it's worth, at least I tell my students, it's worth trying to distinguish the first category, which is interpreting statutes relating to all of this. The second category, which is treaty interpretation, particularly when you're dealing in the treaties that require harmonious interpretation. And the third, when you're really asking the court to do things it doesn't want to do about what is this thing called customary international law? How do we find it? What's it working on? So just a way of, of putting things into uh, into context. The one area where that last category sometimes comes up maybe more frequently is in the area of extraterritorial jurisdiction because in theory our extraterritorial jurisdiction is cabined or built on notions of international principles of jurisdiction. They're all pretty permissive. The Supreme Court can and other courts can draw on it. I don't think they have a whole lot of salience but there's some extraterritorial cases coming up. So that's my, my contribution. That, that's that's a very helpful context. So so we have one other set of cases to talk about, but I, I really like interactive panels, and I want to make sure that we, we address anything that's on the audience's mind. So anybody want to talk, ask any questions, or make any comments about anything we've discussed thus far? Or should we move on? While they're thinking, can I make one comment Please. on what the uh, previous speakers have said in response to what really was a profound question that Caroline posed it to us, and uh, David acknowledged that it was a profound question, and the question was, what's the ideal methodology for interpreting the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act? And the reason that it's profound, really, is that it touches on all of these big questions, like whether we have a dynamic approach to interpretation, do we have a purposive approach to interpretation, and when we're interpreting a statute that was enacted sort of in the penumbra of international law, do we use international law as a technique of statutory interpretation? And uh, the Supreme Court just didn't pick up on that. And so whereas um, we had a little colloquy here about the extent of deference that is owed to the executive branch, and the court has said different things about deference in different contexts at different times, and David was uh, teasing me for not having weighed in on that in the brief, we didn't actually want to because we didn't know which way the executive was going to come out, you know? So why would we, a group of professors of international law and organization, say you should take, you know, the, the latest expression of the sovereign will in the form of the latest thing that emanates from the legal advisor? You know, that, that if there's a consistent position of the legal advisor, that should weigh in on something. And if the consistent position of the legal advisor has been 
here's how we comply with international law, then that's a really important thing for the court to hear and a much more important thing for the court to hear than here are the foreign policy implications of this particular case at this moment in international politics. So, uh, but the reason that this question is so profound is that um, there's huge international contestation about what the law of foreign sovereign immunity and what the law of international organization immunity means at any moment in time. For example, can there be a terrorist exception to foreign sovereign immunity? That uh, is probably going to be something that the ICJ will have something to say about. Um, is the expropriation exception uh, compatible with international law? You know, these are these are really hard questions, but I think we should be grappling with them in this room. Well, if I can just um, follow up a little bit on, on Dave's last bit of the three boxes that he laid out, because I thought you might have gone on to say that, yes, there's a box of interpreting the US statute, but we also have this charming Betsy doctrine out there, where if there's some ambiguity in the statute, we actually should be leaping over to your other boxes and thinking about what are obligations that the US has under treaty or custom international law that might shed some light on how best to interpret that statute. And to me, it links back a little bit to the JAMS case because my observation is that there has been a fair amount of assimilation of rules relating to states with rules relating to international organizations. So you get a Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and then you get a Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties as it includes international organizations, and they look almost the same. Or you have 2001 articles on state responsibility, and they look almost the same as the 2011 articles on state responsibility. If one were to now draft a new convention like your 2004 convention, but focused on immunities of IOs, I would predict it looks almost the same. Hmm. Now, an interesting question is would anybody join it? Yeah. Because all of these second tier IO instruments have been much less adhered to than the state level one. So that's an interesting, but, but it does suggest that maybe Lori's side was right in part because maybe states and IOs do operate more in tandem than they should, because I kind of agree with you, they're not the same. Um, but if that's true, then maybe the way we should be interpreting statutes using a charming Betsy approach is to, to recognize that development. If I can pick up on just the first part of what you said, it's really a, a lot to answer there, but maybe there are Supreme Court clerks, former Supreme Court clerks might comment on, on the posse. What if instead of having the Justice Department put in a, a brief on behalf of the US government that says, here's what we think about the law, you had a brief that said, here are the foreign policy concerns, or even more pointedly, here are the possible legal, international legal consequences in the international community uh, of going this way or that, trying to fill out for the Supreme Court this, this broader context that they don't normally hear about. Uh, in my experience, you could try that, and the Justice Department would say, that sounds like policy to us. We don't do policy, we do law. Sit down. Um, and, and, you know, as you know, showing your, your ability to get the Justice Department to file a brief that says what you want it to say and not what they want you to say, pretty limited. But even if you were to do that, I wonder whether the Supreme Court would say, that's what we should, thinking about Sudan and the service of process, we really should think about the broader implications, the non-legal policy consequences and the broader thing, or in jam to do something like that. It's an interesting notion. I don't think it happens in our system. I mean, just, uh, I've seen the United States make arguments like that. I think they made a quite express reciprocity arguments in the, NML discovery case. They mm -hmm. talked a lot about how they they feared being subjected to the type of discovery we were going to, you know, had propounded against uh, Argentina. Um, 
they talked a lot about how our discovery system is completely abnormal from, you know, in a, in a global context. Um, and the Supreme Court, like, just blew that argument to smithereens. Yeah, that's the answer. I'm thinking yeah, that. I mean, they, they just Thank said um, the, the FSIA established rules precisely to take it out of the hands of the executive branch. Precise, you know, the, 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 the ebbs and flows of whatever comes out of a foggy bottom is precisely why Congress enacted the FSIA. That's what they said in NML. Your question? Uh, well, uh, it's about Zimmer. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the qualification of the commercial activity. So, uh, but I'm coming from a continental law uh, country. So, uh, and also, uh, there's just also uh, the fight about the issue about habitual residence. How can we uh, qualify the habitual residence? So, I would like to learn uh, how the uh, US courts qualify the co commercial activity. Uh, they qualify according to the foreign, next foreign or maybe uh, qualified according to the, for example, Ravel's uh, and Ravel's uh, qualification method. So, uh, and the second question is, uh, do you think, or uh, learned uh, Professor Adlaifa, do you think that also uh, the courts, the United States courts, has to introduce a new qualification method uh, that is more uh, suitable uh, for the international law or that uh, doesn't conflict with the international law. Thank you. You know that you can do the foreign solid. Well, I can't right? do. I can't. I can't shed too much light on it. Um, in the 1976 Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, Congress tried to shed a little bit of light. They said that. Uh, whether an activity is commercial depends on the nature of the act and not its purpose. And that was thought to be somewhat of a reversal or modification of the previous line of uh, executive and judicial decisions during the what we call the Tate letter period, the 25 year period between uh, 1952 and 1976. But this whole idea of um, what is the what what is it that makes an act commercial by its nature and intuitively you say if private persons can do it and if private persons do do it then intuitively it is commercial and so the, in the classic examples it's things like maybe you're buying boots for the army but really all that you're doing is selling shoes or in the argentina cases all you're doing is lending or borrowing money that's a commercial activity so against that background i found it very puzzling that the Supreme Court in otherwise agreeing with all the arguments that the petitioners were making in uh, JAM versus International Finance Corporation said, it's not so obvious that when the International Finance Corporation lends money to this development project in India, that that's a commercial activity. I would have said, that sounds pretty commercial to me. Okay. What's yeah. missing is the nexus with the United States because I don't think that it should be an automatic nexus that just because they happen to be headquartered in the United States, that they are suable on every conceivable worldwide activity. I would think that you might need to meet a different kind of uh, <coughs> nexus standard for a case that involved environmental claims in a foreign country. So that's the only answer I can give on um, commercial activity. There's a huge amount of lower court case law. There is also a um, relevant provision that Professor Stewart knows much better than I do in the UN Convention on the Jurisdictional Immunity of States and Their Property, and um, that maybe is a little bit different from um, the US statutory standard. And the fact that there's a bit of a uh, different approach between the US statutory approach and the UN treaty approach has been one disincentive for the US becoming a party to that treaty. Um, uh, habitual residence, I can't shed any light on it at all, except to say that the late Justice Scalia um, 
in one of his interesting interventions on treaty interpretation, urged his colleagues on the court and all courts in the United States to pay attention to uh, judicial decisions in the states of other treaty partners and all things being equal, if somebody in the court system of another treaty partner got there first and said something about it, unless we have some really good reason for disagreeing, we should take a similar approach. And so that's what Professor Stewart was saying. There's going to be a lot of briefing on the uh, child custody rulings in treaty cases involving Portugal or Brazil or wherever. But on the merits, I can't shed light on it. It's not really my area. Yeah, so, so it just I got the 10-minute the warning about four minutes ago. So let's ask one more question, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to sort of wrap it up with a final word. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, just following your question, um, I'm wondering, you talk about also functional immunity in the young case and mm -hmm. how we have to differentiate between our sort of immunity and sovereign immunity in a case and also functional immunity. You talk that maybe it will be a way Will be a really interesting panel about that on um, October 18th at International Law uh, Week. No, October 11th. 11th. October 11th, sorry. Or maybe it's the 12th. Yeah. Octo International, Law, International Weekend. Law Weekend, the Saturday of the International Law Weekend. And there will be speakers on exactly that point uh, from the international organization's uh, legal offices. And it really depends on what the functions of the international organizations are. If the functions are everything as broad as what the UN does, then uh, an absolute rule, I think, is probably critical to their functioning. And we need to develop these kinds of internal mechanisms and um, accountability mechanisms that don't rely on the national courts of the host state, because if you were going to open up uh, an organization like the United Nations that does everything everywhere across the whole range of human endeavor to being sued in um, U.S. courts on all those claims, um, it would not be able to function. But if the function of the organization is to lend money or to borrow money or to um, engage in commercial activity, then uh, they don't require the same level of immunity. Can, can I add one thought to that? This is a really important point. And, and this is another reason why I think the Jams case is, is really uh, misguided and, and we need a different approach. When the United States adopted the International Organization Act, there weren't any real international, yes, there was the UPU and, and so on, but they did it in anticipation, it, actually to invite the UN to come. Well, one reason it's absolute immunity is come on and we'll protect you. Um, today, there are, what, hundreds of international organizations, no longer is it just one or three or five states? It's not just Paris and Geneva and London and New York and, and Montreal, but there's something, a headquarters in over 30, maybe even more uh, state uh, cities around the, the, the world. All those jurisdictions and more are beginning to have to address these questions. So there's a, an emergent customary international law. It's not documented, it's not called together, it needs to be, because if we're going to adopt a rule, I don't think it ought to be just our rule. I think it ought to take into account, coming back to your question, uh, the emergent practice around the world. And that's going to be a difficult question, because um, different countries have different approaches to it. Different, different entities have, have negotiated different things. I will tell you this, some of the mumbling in the international organization community here in Washington is, if we're going to be subject to the US courts, for things that we do in third countries that are within our mission, we're not going to have our headquarters here in New York. So that's that, that's a very real possibility. Nobody wants that. It doesn't make any sense. I don't think the courts should should be the supervisor. Our courts shouldn't be the supervisor. The question is then what's the replacement? And step A is you guys got to take care of your own stuff in a rational way. Step B might be an international court or body to do these things, but that's that's you know, I'm not going to see that. You might see that. I'll see that.
So I, I do think we need to, to wrap up. Unfortunately, I have a, a, you know, they're very strict about the time here, and I, and I like to honor that as well. But um, I, we promised we'd, we'd, we'd comment on something that we haven't. Does anyone have you know a one minute uh, comment on anything we're seeing in the international law, international relations space from Kavanaugh, maybe even Gorsuch still? Any interest or particular leanings uh, that are changing based on those two Supreme Court justices? I. I mean, I, I don't know if it's about Kavanaugh or Gorsuch specifically. I, I do think the Manaski case is going to be quite interesting to watch, um, in, in part because it is not a federal statutory case. So you, you will have an opportunity to, to see the justices apply potentially a different mode of, of interpretation to a treaty. I also think it's going to be interesting to see what they do, what the you know conservative majority does with the United States' argument in that case, where the United States is basically urging that, you know, to determine habitual residence, you just kind of need to look at the totality of the circumstances, and it's a multi-factored weighing of vaporous factors, and the conservative majority is going to hate that test. They're just going to hate it. The textual approach. Yeah, what I mean, they well, but, well, they're just, well, no, they hate multi-factor, you know, balancing because there's no content to it. It's just whatever, you know, you want, you can manipulate the factors to reach an outcome. So I think, uh, and where you're talking about, you know, a child and where, which parent the child goes to is at stake. I think they're going to find that particularly troubling, um, because to have a contentless standard in the, this international, you know, child abduction scenario, just, means that, you know, the home court is virtually always going to win. So um, that, I, I, I think, will be a very interesting case to watch. And, you know, and, and obviously Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are firmly in the conservative camp. So how they react to the United States' argument will be something I watch with interest. Well, please join me in thanking our excellent panelists for uh, a very interesting <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, maybe, sir, you can get your question answered. Out.